Whether you're hitting the road or kicking back in the cab, it's time to take a load off with Big Rig Banter. Powered by AllTruckJobs.com, your source for finding the trucking jobs drivers really want. Get ready to shift into gear and let the conversations roll. All right, truckers, this is Troy Diffenderfer. And this is Lene Roll. And you're listening to the 22nd episode of Big Rig Banter, and it's actually the last episode of 2018. Lene, how are you doing today? I'm good, Troy. How are you? Good. So, like I said, we're winding down, Lene. Uh, January 1st is quickly upon us. Do you have any New Year's resolutions that you want to get off your chest? Maybe be nicer to me on the podcast or anything? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Mine would probably be to eat a little healthier. I know you always give me crap for what I eat at lunch. I think it's unnecessary, but I do agree that well, I might need to lay off the McDonald's. Yeah, because then I want to eat it too. Did you make any resolutions last year? Uh, probably the same one as this year, <laughs> and it didn't really g- go that well. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk yeah, about our. Yeah. Let's talk about our first. Let's talk about how you can't talk, and now I'll do it. (laughs) Fine, fine. (laughs) Right now, we're going to count down the top five things that we think you should keep an eye on for next year. Um, The first one is actually a Supreme Court case. A truck driver, Dominic Oliveira, actually um, sued a company that he was working for, New Prime, about his uh, pay, and the court case actually made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, this case is something that will be decided in 2019, probably somewhere between the new year and June, Um, but we had a chance to sit down and talk with Dominic's lawyer, Jennifer Bennett, and she is from um, an organization called Public Justice. So let's listen to what Jennifer has to say um, about the case and what it could mean for drivers. Uh, So the lawsuit, the underlying lawsuit, is about um, New Prime not paying its drivers minimum wage. So Dominic started at New Prime because they advertise this paid apprenticeship program where new drivers work alongside experienced drivers. Uh, But it turned out that although it's advertised as a paid apprenticeship, at first he actually wasn't paid at all. Uh, and in fact, the company said that Dominic owed him, uh, that Dominic owed the company money for driving for it. Uh, and the company says, now you owe us tuition for this, you know, paid apprenticeship, uh, and that we'll only forgive this tuition if you work for us for a year. And so Dominic did. And even once Prime started paying him, his paycheck was often far less than minimum wage because the company would deduct, you know, the cost of the truck he was driving and gas and supplies. Uh, And so at the end of the day, there were some weeks when Dominic's paycheck was actually negative. That is, he had to pay prime for the privilege of driving a truck for them. And, you know, of course, there are state and federal minimum wage laws, but prime says that these laws don't apply to it because they labeled Dominic an independent contractor. Um, And, you know, we see this not just with Prime, but there, you know, we've seen this with other companies in the industry that have done the same thing. Um, and like some of these other companies, we think that Dominic wasn't actually an independent contractor, that he was, you know, called an independent contractor. But in fact, we believe he was just a regular employee like anyone else. You know, the company controlled his schedule. It controlled his work. Dominic couldn't work for any other trunking company. And so we think that these state and federal minimum wage laws apply to prime. And we also think that there are probably um, lots of other drivers working for the company that were in the same boat as Dominic, which is to say that there are, we think that there are likely um, a large group of drivers that prime called independent contractors and therefore thought it didn't have to pay minimum wage to these drivers. And so you know, a few years ago now, Dominic sued Prime on behalf of himself and on behalf of all of these other drivers saying that Prime has to follow the state and federal minimum wage laws and pay these drivers what they're owed. And what Prime said is, no, you can't sue us. Prime said, you know, took out this contract that they had Dominic sign in order to drive for them. And they said, look at this contract we made you sign. Um, And in this contract, we've put in a clause in the fine print saying that you are giving up your right to go to court, that you can't sue us. If you have any problem, you have to go to this thing called arbitration. Um, 
And what arbitration is, is it's a private process. Um, it often costs much more than court. It's often secret. Uh, and there's very, very limited opportunity to appeal. Right. And so Prime said, you can't do this court thing. You have to go to do this arbitration thing. Um, and Prime also said in this fine print contract that they had Dominic sign just to drive for them, not only do you have to go to arbitration, but we put in this clause that says you can't join together with any other drivers to bring your claims together. Each person, if they want to sue us, has to do so. They have to go it alone. Um, and so Prime tried to get Dominic kicked out of court for this reason. Um, but as it turns out, the Federal Arbitration Act, which is the federal law that Prime asked the court to use to enforce this arbitration clause, has an exemption for the contracts of employment of transportation workers. Okay. And yeah, and so <laughs> truck drivers are transportation workers, turns out. Yes. And we said, hey, this law you're trying to use, uh, it has this exemption for exactly the kinds of people you're trying to use it on. Uh, and what Prime said is, well, not so fast. This exemption applies to the text of the exemption, so it applies to the contracts of employment of transportation workers. And what Prime wants to argue is that because it labeled Dominic an independent contractor, his contract isn't a contract of employment. And so that's the fight. Um, it turns out if you go back to when the law was originally written, which is 1925, <laughs> it's super clear that the phrase contracts of employment meant everybody's agreement, including those of independent contractors. Um, and it wouldn't make any sense, right, for Congress to write a law that only applied to companies who properly labeled their workers employees, but allowed companies that illegally misclassify their workers to get around the law. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, and so that's what the Supreme Court is deciding now. It's not the Supreme Court. We haven't even gotten to, you know, the underlying, the real question in the lawsuit of, you know, does Prime have to pay its workers minimum wage? Um, because all of the fight so far has been about can Prime kick its workers out of court? Okay. And so when the qu Supreme Court reaches their decision, what are like the two options, I guess, that they could could say? So there are actually three options they could say. Okay. They could say what what Prime wants them to say, and what Prime wants them to say is that this law that we're using to try to force drivers into arbitration, um, whether this law applies depends only on what we call our drivers. So if we call our drivers independent contractors, then the law applies um, regardless of whether the drivers actually are independent contractors. It doesn't matter you know, nothing about the driver's actual work matters. All that matters is what we say, right? And that would, of course, incentivize companies to manipulate what they call their workers, right? Sure. Um, so that's one option. Um, the second option is what we're arguing, which is, you know, look, if you go back to what these words meant when the law was passed, Congress was clearly trying to exempt all transportation workers. Congress didn't care, you know, whether the transportation worker was an independent contractor or not. Um, the whole point of this exemption is that Congress was really worried that people in the transportation industry were striking and interrupting commerce. So, like, there were a bunch of railroad strikes, which meant that fruit was rotting on trains and stuff like that. Right. Um, and so Congress wanted to be able to resolve these kinds of disputes as a group. They wanted, they didn't want these kinds of disputes going, you know, to this individual private forum where everybody had to fight, you know, one on one with the employer because then the workers would just all strike um, and that would cause problems. Um, and so you know, what we say is, look, you know, if you look at what these words meant at the time, if you look at what Congress is trying to do, then um, it's clear that Congress is trying to exempt all transportation workers, regardless of whether they were independent contractors or employees, because all transportation workers, you know, it doesn't matter whether a driver is an independent contractor or employee. If all truck drivers, you know, walked off the job tomorrow, that would be a huge problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're like, this, it's the same. Um, if you don't have drivers, you can't get your stuff anywhere. Um, and so, you know, the our position is that the court should hold that the exemption applies to everyone. And then there's a middle position that the court could hold, um, which is, you know, what some lower courts have hold, held, um, which I think is, you know, 
more correct than prime's position but not exactly the right one which is that the court could say you know it's not what the company calls it's not that the exemption applies to all drivers and it's not what the company calls the driver but what matters is whether the driver is actually in fact an employee and so that's sort of in between the two positions that um we and prime are arguing for um, which is to say we look at what they're actually doing um i think that's you know I think that makes more sense than letting companies, you know, just call their drivers whatever they want and decide for themselves whether the law applies. But I don't think that's what the law actually, like the words of the law actually mean um, or what Congress was intending. And what does the Supreme Court's decision mean for truck drivers going forward? I mean, what, you know, you said there's three options that they could probably uh, choose from. So how will that impact truck drivers? Yeah, I mean, so if the court, says that, you know, all that matters is what the company says you are, then companies who already have lots of incentives to misclassify their drivers as independent contractors will have one more incentive to do that. And it means that companies who do illegally misclassify their drivers will have, you know, federal law that they can use to kick those drivers out of court, which, you know, practically speaking means that fewer drivers will be able to go to court uh, to bring their claims. You know, if uh, Dominic wins and if the court holds that the law means what it says, um, that the law, you know, doesn't apply to um, any transportation workers, no matter what they're labeled, um, then that means that, you know, Dominic will be able to continue with his case in court, um, which hopefully will help both him, but also lots of drivers like him who had the same problem at Prime. You know, I think when I think about this case, uh, the thing that I think it is really important about it is I think it shows how important it is for drivers to be able to band together to fight for what they think is right, um, to have their day in court, to get fair wages. You know, um, if Dominic is able to bring a class action in court, it means that he can put his name on a lawsuit and lots of people who might not be comfortable putting their names on a lawsuit because, you know, maybe they still work for Prime and so are afraid of retaliation or maybe there are other reasons that they couldn't put their name on a lawsuit or if they had to sue alone, they couldn't afford to do it. Dominic can put on his, his name on a lawsuit and stand up for all of those people at once if he's able to bring a class action in court. And that's the kind of thing that Prime and companies like it, when they try to enforce their arbitration clauses, are trying to stop. They're trying to prevent drivers from being able to do this, to shunt them into a secret forum where, um, you know, often they say you can't band together with your fellow drivers. You have to go it alone. Uh, And lots of people won't be able to do that. And so I think that's the thing that I think is really important about this case and this kind of case um, is um, that it allows drivers to band together. And I think in general, both in court and in we've seen it, you know, there's recently been um, attempts to pass legislation that would be harmful to truck drivers and truck drivers and others banded together to fight it. Like, I think it shows the importance of, you know, the power that drivers have when they band together and how hard some companies are fighting to prevent them from doing that and how important it is for them to be able to do that. Thanks again to Jennifer for all of that information. It'll be interesting to see what the highest court of the land decides. Yeah, and let's keep the countdown rolling. Our second top trucking trend for 2019 is the continuation of ELDs and the improved analytics that will come along with it. I had the chance to sit down with Dean Croak, who is the chief inside officer at FreightWaves.com, and he had a lot of really cool points. Um, You owner-operators or small companies out there are really going to be able to take advantage of ELDs next year. So let's listen to what Dean had to say. I think there'll be some wrinkles need to be ironed out as people move through to the end of 2019 and and become compliant completely with ELDs. So the uh, the there's a there was the grace period if you recall where they had to move the um, move off the older AOBDRs. I think it is, it's, is the acronym the older style electronic devices where they you know they essentially have to become compliant by nine. December 19, I think it is 2019, and they have to have the same sort of uh, 
uh, firmware upgrades on those devices. So I think that'll be the big change. And the difference in the two devices are essentially that the older style ELD, you could uh, put uh, uh, sort of change the geofence as to when the, dry, the truck started to trigger on duty driving. So with a current ELD device, as soon as you go over five miles an hour, um, and I think that's the case for most of them, it triggers an automatic movement to on-duty driving on line three. So with the older AODDRs, there was a there was a, a way you could actually increase that speed threshold to 20 miles an hour and you know maybe a one mile radius, so that you could do moves around a truck stop or a shipper location without it triggering an on-duty event. So that's the central difference. I think with ELDs, that'll be the big change from a technology perspective. I just think, generally speaking, though, most carriers have probably got ELDs. They're already adapted to them. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't like the underlying regulations. I think being compliant to unsafe regulations won't make fleets any safer. So, uh, but my you know my theory is that if I was uh, having to run ELDs today, and I, and I do have an ELD in my truck, just just for the record, um, I, I find the data that comes off the ELD device to be really really interesting. So I would encourage carriers to uh, not think so much about being compliant to the regulations, but finding ways to use the ELD data to understand how to operate their business more profitably. Because there's some really good data points in the ELD data stream that tell you about, uh, you know, trip speeds, trip timing, dwell time, you know, how much dwell time you have between loads, uh, what lanes you might run are the most profitable. Uh, the ones where you have a higher average road speed, where you have the least traffic. And I know a lot of the listeners might already know that intuitively, but for some fleets where they don't have a lot of data, the ELD data stream from their vendor could be really, really insightful, uh, especially those smaller fleets where they don't necessarily have a lot of visibility into what their fleets, uh, their, their trucks are doing. So ELD is a very rich data source. Uh, that's what, I, If you said what was going to be the one big trend, uh, next year with ELDs, uh, beyond the need to be compliant with the regulations for the old devices, I think it will be a lot of the people that have these devices will find ways to generate more insight from the data that comes off them. I think that's going to be the big change next year. And once again, that's Dean Croak. If you want to hear more of what he has to say, feel free to check out some of his articles he has written on FreightWaves.com. All right. The third trucking trend of 2019 to keep an eye on is autonomous trucking. We've talked about that a few times here in 2018, but it's definitely something that is going to continue to evolve in the coming year, as well as technology in the cab of your truck. I got to sit down with Ben Schill from Paper Transport, so here's what he had to say about autonomous trucking. Yeah, so specifically, I think the whole industry, um, you know, we're going to see significant um, um, investments uh, from a technology perspective in our industry. And uh, there's a number of things that will be behind the scenes and, you know, connectivity between carriers and shippers and, and uh, how we interact and, and do business and, and provide visibility. However, I believe there's some significant um, impacts that that is going to have on uh, professional drivers as well. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, I'm really excited uh, about is there's, there's all this talk about autonomous trucks and, you know, what, what's happening uh, with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, communication. And, you know, when I look at what's happening on that front and how that's going to affect our drivers, I think it's some of the most uh, exciting technology uh, from a safety perspective um, that is starting to um, hit us. Uh, and, and uh, be part of how we do business. So I think, you know, when you start thinking about the, how smart uh, these trucks are getting in terms of collision mitigation systems, um, smart cameras, and the ability to actually connect with other vehicles, I really view that as a, an awesome opportunity for our industry to continue to um, become safe, uh, more safe, and, uh, you know, it's less about uh, 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 an autonomous truck that's going to operate without an operator. I don't believe that's around the corner, but I truly believe that we're going to start moving in the direction of other industries such as, um, you know, the, the airline industry or the uh, locomotive industry where there's, there's more automation um, around certain aspects that ultimately leads to uh, a safer work environment uh, for our professional drivers and the motoring public. 
So I think there's a lot of technology around the truck that you're going to continue to see, uh, as well as the, the number of trucks on order right now. Um, and, you know, as these trucks come onto the roads, uh, we're going to see uh, fresher and fresher technology specifically around um, safety. And that was Ben Schill. He's the vice president of Paper Transport. If you want to learn more about his company, you can check it out in our show notes. All right. Thanks, Lene. Let's throw it back to Dean again for number four. He's talking about macroeconomics and the trucking industry on a global scale. There's a lot of geopolitical issues going on right now that's going to impact you truckers in 2019. So let's hear what Dean had to say. There's no question that there are some signs that there's a global slowdown. Uh, we're looking at decreasing oil prices. Uh, the, the container shipping rates all around the world are decreasing. There is some, um, you know, geopolitical activity in the Middle East that's pointing towards, you know, a slowdown in oil production. So I, I just think generally, I don't know that 2018 would be a a year that I would say will continue next year. I, I'm, I'm somewhat cautious. In my outlook for next year, I don't think things will be as good as they are next year as they are this year. So this year is not a year I would use for comparison. So for operators out there thinking they'll have the same demand, I don't think that'll be the case for next year. I think the prices that flatbed carriers and reefer van operators have been able to generate this year, I don't think they'll be there next year. And there's a few reasons why, notwithstanding the fact that the driver shortage will be an ongoing dilemma for the industry. I just think that the you know global growth and then economic growth here in the US will be affected by a couple of things. I think the, the tariffs that we're seeing introduced uh, on China that'll jump to 25% on January the 1st, I think that's going to have a big impact on freight volumes generally. I think there is there are definite signs of a of a slowdown sort of uh, in the in the range of what we saw in 2014. I think that's going to be, um, you know, the, the flow-on effects from this trade war will will affect consumer demand into the new year. So I think that'll be a that'll be a big impact. Uh, we would, you know, the the trade news this morning, trade war news this morning wasn't good, in that the um, the, the Trump administration wasn't able to generate any positive news out of the current talks, and that they didn't think that there'd be any. Uh, change in the tariff deadline on January 1, moving to 25% before the end of the year. So negotiations aren't aren't going well. What does that mean? Well, right now we're seeing a massive inflow of containers shipping freight from Asia into the west coast of the United States to beat the tariff on January 1. So all of the freight that carriers normally haul around the country, dry freight for lead, you know Q1 that's sort of driven by Chinese New Year demand, all that freight's going to be here before Christmas or before January 1st. So it means that the normal flow of freight will be, freight volumes will be affected in Q1 uh, by this influx of container freight coming in now. And, and that'll have a flow on effect across the whole company. So I see some disruption in the, in the volume of freight early in the new year. Uh, we haven't seen freight volumes pick up since uh, the start of October. So, we still see some, uh, you know, instability in the market in that way. I still think there's some markets though where there's not a lot of capacity, so truck operators can find lots of opportunity. You know, Las Vegas today is a is a, a market where you'll get a backload out really quickly. Uh, El Paso, there's a lot of container freight coming up through Mexico into the El Paso market where you could get a a load on the spot market uh, out of there with a pretty good rate and and have very little deadheading and downtime. So. I think there's certain markets around the country, like we know a lot of cheese comes out of Wisconsin this time of the year. About 40% of all cheese gets pushed out of Wisconsin in November and December. So reefer rates are pretty high up there right now. You can run into that market and get a, a backhaul out of there pretty quick. So there's certain markets where there's a lot of activity, but generally speaking, I don't. I, I see, um, you know, capacity sort of tight in some markets, but it's you know capacity. For most of the year, shippers have been seeing capacity. Uh, constrained. They've had trouble finding trucks most of the year, is what shippers generally say. But I think that's going to ease. So I think that we'll return to more, uh, maybe maybe 2017 levels might be a better way to describe this. But certainly, I don't see the same trends flowing over into 2019 as we've seen this year. 
Yeah, and a big thanks to Dean again. And just to clarify, uh, after that interview was recorded, Donald Trump did actually strike a deal with China that would lower the tariff to 10%, which is definitely good. But we spoke to Dean again off the air, and he said that won't have any effect on quarter one, but however, it could have an effect on the following quarter. And for our fifth and final trucking trend to look out for in 2019, Ben brought up an interesting point that he thinks that we'll see an increase in work-life balance for truck drivers. Right now, drivers are used to being on the road for the long haul, and there seems to be a shift to give drivers more of a work-life balance so that they can be at home more with their families. Here's what he had to say about that. I guess I'll hit on what what I believe is probably going to be, you know, one of the the biggest changes that drivers or professional drivers are going to start to see, and that is I think we're really going to see an accelerated shift toward um, more frequent home time, whether it's home daily or home multiple times a week. Um, I really um, am seeing a shift in the market right now, specifically with new drivers coming into the market, um, kind of demanding uh, home daily jobs. Uh, With the economy uh, where it's at and unemployment at, at, you know, near record lows, um, there's lots of opportunities outside of our industry for people to make decent money and have work-life balance. So we're not just competing with, um, you know, other carriers in terms of finding great professional drivers, but we're, we're really starting to compete with uh, other industries that are offering a better work-life balance. So I see an accelerated shift uh, really over the next year or so. I think it's already coming a lot faster. Um, Just anecdotally, I can say, you know, we hire some drivers uh, right out of uh, um, a a select group of uh, um, established driving schools. And I would say, you know, 18 to 24 months ago, it it was not uncommon to tell those new students, hey, you need to go over the road. You have to kind of cut your teeth, if you will. Um, And after you get some experience, then you'll be eligible for, you know, some home daily roles. And I think the, the industry operated um, in that fashion. And like I said, I, you know, now up the last six to 12 months, when you're in talking to new candidates that are coming into the industry, um, they're not even going to talk to you if you're not offering. Um, no, that's a general statement. Um, a lot of them um, are, are kind of demanding uh, home daily opportunities, and they're going to forego significant earnings um, to be at home with their family and, and uh, have the work life that, that, um, that they want. So I think we're going to see an accelerated shift toward uh, more frequent, frequent uh, home time. Um, I also believe that's going to lead to a significant uh, um, a pay variance between drivers that are willing to run either regionally or longer and, and be on the road for uh, five plus days. And I think you're going to see the, you know, the wage levels of, of those individuals rise significantly. Um, at the same time, you're going to see a, a creation of more uh, home daily jobs. So that wraps up our trucking trends for 2019. Just to recap, the five things that we think you guys should keep an eye on for 2019 Uh, The first one is that Supreme Court case that Jennifer Bennett shared with us involving a truck driver and the trucking company. The second one was Dean Croak talking about ELDs and what that could mean for data collection in the future. Um, Our third trend was Ben Schill talking about autonomous trucking and how that will evolve in the coming year. Um, Let's see, number four, Dean talked about macroeconomics. And then wrapping it up with number five, we had Ben again talking about a work-life balance. And just a reminder, we'll have our interviewees listed in the show notes, so you can check that out if you want to ask them any questions or get to know more about them. That wraps up our Trucking Trends for 2019 podcast. Lene, here's to another year of recording a podcast with you. I know. I bet you can't wait for 2019, a full year with me on the show. Of course. And once again, a big thanks. Happy holidays to everyone listening. I hope you truckers enjoy your holiday season. I'm your co-host, Troy Diffenderfer. And I'm your favorite co-host, Lene Roll. 
And this has been Big Rig Banter. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Big Rig Banter. For your next job, check out alltruckjobs.com, the premier online source for finding the best driver jobs in the country. Browse hundreds of positions by freight or driver type to get back on the road with confidence. Click subscribe to keep the conversations coming. Until next time on Big Rig Banter.